outside. Let's uh, make a little music together. Why don't you join me? Stand if you're willing and able and stand up and open your heart to what God has for you today. We're going to sing a little bit, all right? All right, I'm going to teach you this little chorus, okay? It's just a simple little thing. I want you to lean into it. If it's new to you, belt it out anyway. Bold mistakes, right? Goes like this. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. Alright, ready? Let's do that again. One, two, three. All my life, all I know, God's been good, good to my soul. Mountain high, valley low, I'm gonna sing wherever I go. your breath away, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm, anybody else like, <laughs> I am happy to tell you that the breath of God, the breath of the Holy Spirit will give you that breath right back. So take a minute, catch your breath. It's been a busy week. There's been a lot going on this week. Take a deep breath in knowing that God's spirit sustains, encourages, and enlivens you. Breathe in and take a Exhale, letting go the things that have held you back or made you worry this week. Breathe in God's peace. Breathe out God's love. Breathe in God's peace for others. Breathe out God's peace to others. And breathe in peace. Breathe out peace. And turn to the people around you. And just look at them with your eyes. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. Peace be with you. God doesn't get tired. 
kind of amazing that God doesn't get tired of us, too. <laughs> Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. for the long haul. When we think about the ways that this week has tripped us up, the ways that our lives has, have taken unexpected twists and turns, God, you're with us. Thanks be to God. You are with us. What a gift it is that none of us have to go this life alone. Whether we're in this room for the very first time or whether... We were born into this community, literally. Each one of us is there for each other because we believe in the promise that you do not leave us, 
that you do not faint, you do not grow weary. The psalmist reminds us that from everlasting to everlasting, you are faithful, your love is constant, you remain. We can count on you. Thanks, God, for being with us today and for all the days of our lives. In the name of Jesus, our constant companion. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, so I'll be... reading the scripture for this morning. It's up on the screen. Um, And God spoke all these words, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth or beneath the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I am the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of their parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations for those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, for neither you nor your son or daughter, your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed it and the Sabbath day is made holy. So honor your father and mother so that you may live a long li- li- you may live long in the land that the Lord God is giving you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, you shall not covet your neighbor's house, and you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work, doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but what is helpful for building each other up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who those who listen. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, and slander, among with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ forgave you. Whew, that's a doozy of a scripture, isn't it? It's kind of intense. You know, I... I, Graham did our community meditation last week, and I have been thinking about what he said. He said, last week he said, you know, the people, here comes Moses down the mountain with the Ten Commandments. What does he see? Like on the little tablet thing. Well, I shouldn't call it the little tablet things. On the grand biblical tablets. And they're coming down the mountain. And Graham said, and he like, sees the people. They're already breaking the rules, you know. And, and so, so this morning as we continue singing as we continue sinking deeper into worship. You were given, as you walked in, a little uh, bookmark, right? It says the bridge on one side, and the back it has these breath prayers. And we started those last week, where we breathe in and we breathe out different sections of what those commandments are. You know, I think most of us could be like, whew, I don't have to worry about that. I haven't been coveting any oxes lately. You know, that's not so bad, right? (laughs) But, But there's other stuff on there when you reframe it to a modern context, that we all struggle with. So we're, we're going to keep on singing us for God to, to lead us forward into kindness and away from oxen coveting. All right. together. 
Shepherd, lead us, much we need your tender care. In your pleasant pastures, feed us, for your use, help us prepare. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, you have loved us, yours we are. Blessed Jesus. You have loved us, yours we are. We are yours, oh, do befriend us. Be the guardian of our way. Keep the flock from sin, defend us. Seek us. When we go astray Blessed Jesus Blessed Jesus Hear, oh hear us When we pray Blessed Jesus Blessed Jesus Hear, oh hear us When we pray And only Savior, with your love, our spirits fill. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus, blessed Jesus, hear, oh, hear us when we pray. Blessed Jesus. If you're looking for seats this morning, there's some right in front, and you're not going to want to miss this. I'm just telling you, the people who don't choose to sit in the front are going to miss a front row seat to what I'm about to do <laughs> with this toothpaste. <laughs> so I was remembering as I was preparing for worship this week and I was reading the scripture. Look, they're still standing back there. They're like, we don't want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's safe. <laughs> It will not directly impact you. Well, actually, I shouldn't say that about my own communion meditation. Hopefully, it does directly impact you. <laughs> um, I was remembering this week about a children's sermon that I heard, you know, like 40 years ago. And I've never forgotten it. Um, the minister... I'm going to need both hands. The minister took a tube of toothpaste, and he said... You know, it's really important for us to watch what we say. Because when you speak, it's kind of like toothpaste coming out of a tube. It's kind of hard to get it back in there. You know? So what do you want to have on your plate? Do you want to have lies or jealous commentary? Do you want to have kindness? Do you want to have gentleness? What do you want to have on your plate? And, and the truth is that most of us, I don't know about you, like, I don't know about you, but most of us kind of have a mix on our plate, don't we? 
And when we come to communion, we come with all that we are. We come with, we kind of come to the dinner party with a plate, you know. But what's interesting about being welcome at the communion table is that God takes our plate and gives us a clean one. God, God gives us a clean plate, a fresh start. Something feels different when we're welcome at the table. And God gives us a plate that not only is clean of all of the things that we have maybe gotten wrong, right? But it is loaded with nourishment. It's not just like a little piece of bread that's kind of crummy, or maybe even a little frozen from the week before. This is bread that is thick cut with butter and jam and maybe Nutella if you're real lucky. <laughs> this is nourishment for our bodies and our souls. And so when God invites us to the table, the table is newly set saying, hey, let's start over here. Let's start over here for all of the ways that you have gotten it wrong last week. Let's get this right. Let's be in communion together. You and me, you and me and you and God. And so on the night before um, Jesus was, right before Jesus was arrested, right, on the night he was betrayed, Jesus gathered in an upper room with his friends and he took a loaf of bread and he gave thanks for it and he blessed it and broke it. And then he said these words, let's say them together, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then after supper, Jesus took a cup. And, you know, I like to imagine what that must have felt like. Jesus holding a cup full of promise for us. And Jesus raised it and said, this is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. Our elder Marty Jordan is going to come and pray for us. And just be thinking about that clean plate that you've got coming to the table. Will you pray with me, please? Dear God, as we come to this communion table, help us to open our hearts and hear the words of today's message. We gather here each week to reflect and remember the incredible sacrifice you made for us. And we bring whatever is on our hearts, every burden and every struggle, and we lay it here and we give it to you. We ask you to bless this bread and bless this cup as we accept them as symbols of your love and as a promise of your forgiveness of all the ways we fall short in this life. Thank you for this wonderful gift of communion and thank you for this church community. May we go grow closer to you each day and closer to each other as we share your love and grace here in this church and here on this earth. In God's name we pray, amen. As the deacons come forward, I'll remind you that um, if you are looking for gluten-free communion or the sealed communion, which is like, you know, the celebration cup with the lid on it, you can get that by this exit sign here from Lori. Bread and cup are here in the front and on the side, and you can pick up a piece of bread and dip it into the communion cup, into the chalice. Also next to our deacons, you'll see little figures with their hands outstretched and bowls of mints. This is so you can get a little fresh start from your communion, all right? So sometimes, you know, we learn with all of our different senses. Sometimes you have to use your eyes, sometimes your ears, but let your body experience a little bit of freshness, that clean, fresh plate. This toothpaste smells really good up here, y'all. If you were sitting in the front row, you would be getting that benefit. <laughs> Let's all benefit from the wash of forgiveness that God gives to each one of us. Come forward, receive communion, and take a fresh start.
beginning to heal We can start over We know forgiveness These are hard words to hear In a world where nothing is free It sounds too good to believe But know that it's true This is for you It's like a dance It's like a wheel Less like math Less like a deal more like a heartbreak beginning to heal we can start over we know forgiveness it's so easy to drown in the numbers and the judgments and earnings Keeping track, keeping time While the hours keep burning But you can turn a new way It's a new day It's so easy to drown in the numbers and the judgments and earnings. Keeping score, keeping track, keeping time while the hours keep burning, but you can turn. It's so easy to drown in a world where nothing is free. And it's hard to trust in a promise that sounds too good to believe. But no.
to hear what you say Give me a heart that wants to be willing to love you To love you, yeah And give me new eyes to see Forgiveness, compassion, to love you, to love you, to love you. To see what's around me Give me new ears to hear what you say Oh, give me a taste of what it's like to be willing to love you To love you Forgiveness, compassion, to love you, to love you, we want to love you, we want to for the bridge band good morning how are y'all good good uh welcome welcome to worship glad you are here uh if you're visiting with us we're always glad that you're here we want to make sure we we greet you before you leave and if nobody talks to you i want to know okay so let me know if you're visiting and nobody talks to you uh i want you to, to say something to me uh a couple of just quick reminders um two weeks from today we have a great tradition of the church called the father daughter dance four o'clock on february 5th love for you to come it's a lot of fun uh, all ages. It's down in Jerwoda Hall. This week we have our final core class. Um, we're going to be talking about serving, mission, outreach, why we do it, what we do, why it matters. That's 6.15 in the chapel. Dinner is offered before. And then the last thing is that uh, we accept leadership nominations at Woodmont every uh, January, and we will accept those through the end of this month. So you basically got a week left if you want to get some leadership nominations in. And uh, you, can, you can email those to Amber Moss. Uh, she puts them all together, and then the Kempton Presley is chairing our leadership uh, committee, our nominating committee, and they'll start meeting in February. So just a few quick uh, reminders this morning. Uh, join me for a short word of prayer as we begin today. Uh, loving God, uh, thank you for the chance to come into your house, to hear the beautiful music, to be in community, and to, to hear a word from you. And I, I pray that you'll be present in this place. I pray that anybody who is, is struggling or hurting or uh, feeling hopeless, that they will leave here today with a sense of hope, and I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight. You are our rock, and you are our redeemer. Amen. So we're in this, uh, this January sermon series called Starting Over, Back to the Basics of Faith, and what we're doing is we're acknowledging that 
January is a time to begin again, right? The new year, time to start over. And, and we're going back and we're talking about the fundamentals of our faith, back to the basics of faith. And so we talked about core beliefs. I shared with you a few weeks ago my core beliefs and I asked you to think about yours. Then last week we talked about the first four of the 10 commandments and I'm calling these guardrails for life, but there they are. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. Don't take the Lord's name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. And so these four, like I said, have to do with our relationship with God. And today we move on to the final six that have to do with our relationship with each other. So four that really focus on the relationship with God and six that focus on our relationship with each other. Now, let me ask you this this morning. Can you imagine what it would feel like to live in a world where people didn't hurt each other? Where we didn't gossip or talk bad about each other? Can you imagine what it would be like to live in a world where people always treated others the way that they wanted to be treated? Where families weren't broken and, and friends didn't let each other down? Can you imagine what it would be like to live in a world without social media? <laughs> uh, where kids don't get excluded and bullies don't thrive online, and the most toxic people don't have the, the largest followings. Can you imagine what it would be like to live in a world where people honored their commitments, they listened more than they talked, they respected their elders, and they took genuine interest in the lives of other people? That, that would be an incredible world, wouldn't it? I, I could sign up for that. I think when Jesus talks about the kingdom of God, I think it might include some of those things. I'm not sure but that might be more of what he had in mind. Um, the Ten Commandments, I said last week, were given by God to the Israelite people, and this is what it looks like to live in a covenantal relationship with God. And, and so God led the people out of Egypt, cared for them, looked over them, and then two centuries later, Jesus comes along and he says, hey, I can sum all these things up in two basic commandments. Love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength, broken down right there on the screen, the first four, and love your neighbor as yourself, what we're gonna dive into are the final six. But guess what? Even if we just take Jesus at his word, the 10 rules, the 10 guardrails, as, I've, as I'm calling them, still apply. They are a much more specific description of how we are to live, how we are to act, how we are to treat each other, following these rules is in our best interest. I was talking to the kids and I said, tell me some rules that your parents give you. And one of them said, you know, clean up my room. One of them said, we can't use knives. That was a good one. One of them said, no violence with the dog. So that's a good, don't, com don't combine those two, right? Um, but, but I said, do you think your parents give you these rules because they just wanna be hard on you? No, they give you these rules because they love you and they want what's best for you. Well, guess what? It's the same thing with the Ten Commandments. God has given us these commandments, these guardrails, because God loves us and God wants what is best for us. So let's move into the final six. Guardrail number five, honor your father and your mother. Um, my mom passed away 17 years ago. She took her own life, she was very depressed. But since then, I've done everything in my power to try to honor her legacy and to remember everything that she taught me and to remember that the, the, the days weren't always bad. There were lots of good times before she got really sick. But when you have a parent that you lose that way, it's, it's really hard. It leaves a lot of questions. I think this guardrail is much more challenging for adults than it is for children because there's something that happens as we get older. When we grow up and we become adults, and, and, and it takes some people longer than others, right, uh, to become adults. Um, we once thought that our parents who hung the moon actually aren't perfect. And we begin to see their shortcomings and their character flaws a little bit. And, 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 and sometimes that's really disillusioning because we always thought, well, our parents are perfect, right? They could do no wrong. I mean, they were the ones we looked up to. They were the ones we idolized. But then we say, oh, no, they have their flaws just like, just like us. And all I'm saying is that it's really hard for some people to, to come to terms with that. Um, this commandment might be really tough if you feel like your, your parents don't deserve to be honored or you know, maybe your dad left when you were young, you never knew him. Maybe you were physically abused as a child. Maybe there was infidelity and your 
parents' marriage and you have resentment over that. Maybe there was a, a drinking problem or an addiction in your home. Maybe there was favoritism showed to another sibling. Maybe your parents had completely unrealistic expectations of how you were going to turn out and you could never live up to them. Maybe your parents got a divorce uh, when you were growing up and when you needed them most, they were fighting with each other. Or maybe you're like me and you lost a parent in a tragic way. I don't know. I just know that for some people, this can be a really hard commandment to honor because some people in life, they don't feel like their parents deserve to be honored. But listen to what it says in the text after the commandment. Honor your father and mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving to you. See, in ancient Israel, the family unit lived and traveled together. Um, and so what happens is the, the grandparents would come back in with the children and maybe the grandchildren, and they would travel together. And so the, the children and the grandchildren would take care of the aging parents, um, and, and that's just the way it worked. And so if you wanted to have your kids one day take care of you, then you were faithful and you took care of your aging parents. They didn't have social security back then. They didn't have all the concepts, you know, assisted living facilities. So that was a deal. Family stayed together. But can you get frustrated with them? Yes. But God says, honor them, respect them, love them, cut them some slack. And then maybe one day your children will honor you. I love the story that's told. I think I heard this in seminary about a, a, an elderly father had moved back in with his, his daughter and her family and the man was old and weak, and, he, and every time he would eat, he would spill stuff all over, and he would shake, and his spoon would shake. And so finally, one day, the daughter had had it, and she, she, she got the man, and she stuck him in the corner, and she gave him a tray and a wooden bowl and said, you eat here. You can't be at the table anymore. She was so fed up. And then later that week, she walked into her uh, son's room, and, and he was over in the corner, and he had a block, and he was just kind of carving into the block. She said, sweetie, what are you doing? Oh, hey, mommy. What are you doing, sweetie? Oh, I'm, I'm carving a wooden bowl so that you'll have something to eat of one day out of when you come live with me. <laughs> How about that? Guardrail number six, you shall not murder. Now, hopefully, hopefully nobody's dealing with this or wrestling with this this morning, right? Jesus, you know, actually said when it comes to you shall not murder, he said, um, first you gotta deal with your anger. That's what he said, remember? But for obvious reasons, this commandment has always, and guess what, will always, open the door to discussions where faith and politics seem to collide and intersect. So we would all agree this commandment is good, but Christians disagree as to when it should be enforced. What about war? What about the death penalty? What about abortion? What about euthanasia? That's where it's not always clear cut for many people. Um, I've told you guys before, and I'm speaking for me personally, I've always been drawn to what has been called a consistent ethic of life. And guess what? That doesn't cut down clear political lines, by the way. But it's amazing to me how this particular commandment, you shall not murder, leads to so much controversy because people always debate how and when it should be applied. And, and, and so you can't have a society where people can go out and kill other people and there are no repercussions, right? I, I wouldn't want to live in, in, in that kind of culture. But it does get complicated when we get into these specific issues. Um, I've quoted Stanley Hirawas and Will Willimon wrote this book on the Ten Commandments. And this is something that they say. They say, God, the giver of life, is the only one with the right to take life. The fundamental presumption in scripture is simple. Life belongs to God. Life is not an end in itself. Life is God's creation. And we stand in awe of life as we stand in awe of God. But, but, but guess what? When the Supreme Court made their decision last summer, um, not everybody felt the same way. You guys know that. Guardrail number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Commonly paraphrased as you shall not sleep with somebody who's not your spouse. That's a slang, right? Very few things will rock a marriage like infidelity. It is the ultimate betrayal of trust, but I do believe that marriages can get through it because I've seen it. Adultery is a symptom that something has gone wrong in a marriage. Generally speaking, men and women who commit adultery wanna feel loved and affirmed, chased, uh, admired, heard, respected, and for whatever reason, they're not finding that in their marriage. And so lots of times when adultery happens, the marriage has been put on cruise control. It's not been a priority for some time. The marriage has just kind of been put out of mind. And, and, and often, you know what? It's because kids 
Try raising young kids. That'll take your attention away from your spouse because it's all consuming. But I think the best thing we can do is focus on what it means to intentionally love another person and to live out the vows that we made before God and our family and friends for better, for worse, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. To remember the words of the Apostle Paul when he says love is patient, it's kind, it's not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but it rejoices in the truth. It it bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends. But love must be proactive. You know, neglecting love is what leads to adultery. And the best way to prevent that is to be intentional in your marriage or to be intentional in your relationship if you're not married, to make that person a priority. And so boundaries are really important in our culture. Boundaries matter in marriage and in life. They must be set. They must be honored. Boundaries will keep us from making poor decisions. But there's no substitute for being proactive in your marriage and in your relationship. Healthy couples make their relationships a priority. Guardrail number eight. Commandment eight. You shall not steal. Um, So I was born and raised in Memphis, West Tennessee. Um, Lots of things get stolen in Memphis, okay? I'm just going to tell you that. Um, I can tell you lots of stories about theft. Uh, when I was young, our yard guy broke into our garage and he stole our leaf vacuum. And, you know, then he denied it, but somebody saw him pushing it down the street. So, there, you know, there goes that. Um, w- 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 when I was a young adult minister, we had an adult Bible study in a, close to my house, a house in Memphis. And, and not once, but twice one night, people came and broke into cars during the Bible study, stole iPods, whatever, knocked out the windows. Uh, my best friend came out one morning and he, he had like an old Lexus sedan and he came out and his Lexus was on blocks. Uh, the wheels were gone, okay? Um, I can tell you stories about theft, but I don't want to talk about theft so much as stuff that you steal. It's, that's true. But it's theft as omission and neglect. It doesn't just apply to things. Um, adultery is a form of theft. It's uh, stealing the happiness of another family, your family. Um, What about the concept of stealing time? You know, time is the one commodity that we can't get back. Once it's gone, it's gone. Working too much and being away from your kids and your family, being away from home too much, giving everybody else your best and then just giving your, your family and your loved ones and your kids what's left over, I call it the crumbs. Not being present when we're around the people that deserve our best. What about having more than enough resources to help people that are in need and not doing it? Um, Howard Wasson and Willimon say temperance, the moderate attachment to the world's goods and the pursuit of justice, limiting our desire to pursue our neighbor's goods as well as increasing our desire to render them what is their due are the ways we learn to be a people who are not captured by theft. You know, sometimes selfishness and greed keeps us from helping people who are desperately in need because we've convinced ourselves that we need more and more, and yet somebody over here is hungry, they don't have clothes, they don't have anything to drink, and Jesus says, go take care of them. Theft takes lots of forms. But there's one thing we can never get back, and it's time. And so we all have to use our time and monitor our time very carefully because once it's gone, it's gone. And if you're raising children, the days are long, the years are fast, but you gotta take advantage of it because one day, as people in this room will tell you, the time will be gone. Guardrail number nine. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Don't lie. Tell the truth, seek the truth. Um, Our culture has a hard time with the truth. Have y'all noticed this? There's lots of books and articles that are being written about this, but part of the postmodern age is that we can't agree on facts. And and, and there's lots of reasons why people lie. I mean, what I've noticed over the years, I'll just name a few. There's fear. People lie out of fear. They lie out of shame and guilt. They're ashamed of something that they did. They don't want to talk about it. They lie out of selfishness. They lie because they have ambition. They want to get somewhere. Or they lie in the South just because they want to be nice. They don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. Bless their heart. I'm not going to tell you what I think. You can't do that down here, right? But we now live in an age where everybody's having a hard time figuring out what's true. And and by the way, where to look for truth. Um, You can watch two different news stations covering the same story, and the facts are totally different. So then most people will just stick to the facts that serve their agenda. 
You remember what Mooneyham said? He said, you're entitled to your own opinion, you're not entitled to your own facts, but we really debate the facts. Everybody is looking for the truth, but Jesus said, the truth will set you free. What is truth? You know, truth is what we have to work towards. Um, let me ask you just a couple questions just to show you what I'm talking about. Is global warming a reality? Do humans play a role? Is there a double standard in politics? Does Nashville have a growth problem? Is there an affordable housing crisis? Is our culture becoming more secular? See, I can ask simple questions and you guys might come to different answers and for you that would be your truth. But truth matters and we're commanded to seek the truth and to tell the truth. And yet, if you tell the truth, you know, you got nothing to worry about. But if you don't tell the truth, it always catches up with you. It's okay to say I was wrong, I was mistaken. It's okay to say I, I don't know. Uh, it's okay to say let me, let, me, let me find that answer and get back to you. The truth will set you free. Tell the truth. It's healthy for relationships. It's healthy for friendships. It's healthy for marriages. Lastly this morning, guardrail number 10 with living with each other. Do not covet. Do not be envious. Do not be jealous. Do not always want what other people have. Um, how's that working out for us in our social media age? Jonathan Haidt uh, followed his research for years, teaches at NYU, um, very well respected. He wrote an article recently on social media, I mentioned it last week, and he basically said, we are now living in the compare and despair age. And he says, Gen Z, basically born 1995 and later, they're having a really hard time. They have a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, a lot of uh, suicidal ideations. They're not doing that great. You cannot live a life of gratitude if you're always focused on what everybody else has. You have to count the blessings in your own life and put energy and time into that and then give thanks to God, the giver of all good things. Does it mean that we're never gonna be jealous? Does it mean that we're never gonna say, that's not fair? How did they get that? Or why did they get that? No, you're gonna feel that way. But don't pour lots of energy into that emotion. Don't covet what everybody else has. What does it accomplish? These are the basic guardrails that I shared last week and today of how we have a relationship with God and how we have a relationship with each other. We know these, we know them. We may not know the right order, we know what they are, but we're called to apply them into every facet of our lives because guess what? When we don't follow these, it leads to chaos, it leads to hurt, we hurt each other. It leads to our priorities being off, our focus being off. And so I promise you, if you think about these and do your best to, to, to apply them and live them out, you're gonna have a much happier, healthier life. You're gonna have a better marriage. You're gonna have a better family. You're gonna have better friendships and work relationships. And you're gonna see and feel the difference. Let me say a prayer to end today. Loving God, as we've spent today and last week uh, talking about these guardrails, these guardrails that were given to Moses many years ago by God on Mount Sinai, they are still very relevant and very appropriate. And so we lift them up as a part of this uh, sermon series, going back to the basics. And, and we pray that, that when we slip up, and we do, that we can admit when we're wrong and we can get back on track. Lord, for anybody that's here today who's hurting, who's lonely, who's struggling, I lift them up. I want them to know that this church cares about them and that we want to encourage them and let them know that they can keep on, keep on keeping on. Open our hearts and minds that we can reflect upon these words. All this I pray in Christ's name, amen. When I was growing up, if something was hard for me, my mom would always say, take a breath. And we've done a lot of that this morning. We've breathed in peace and we have um, breathed in the minty freshness of a fresh start. I went out to get a cup of coffee a minute ago and I came back in and I was, I mean, it smells so good in here, you guys. <laughs> fresh start smells good. We're gonna continue, you know, just 
that's a challenging sermon. It's a challenging text. It's not easy to do. And um, in all three of our services um, this week, we have the breath prayers that we began last week. So I'm going to lead you through the commandments that Clay worked with this morning. So if you like to pray with your eyes closed, use your ears to listen for the breath. If you like to pray with your eyes open, I'll cue you with my hand, but we're going to read these last five. And if you'd like to look and read while you listen, you can grab your bookmark that you were given as you came in. And we'll start with the fifth one. Let's pray together. Deep breath in. Cue me to honor my elders and all the lessons they have taught me. Breathe in. Help me to honor and protect life and vitality in all forms. Please give me strength to be faithful and loyal. Keep me on the path of generosity and integrity. Don't let me lay claim to what doesn't belong to me. Let honesty resound in my soul. Let me speak truth lovingly. God, release me from jealous thoughts. Guide me back towards gratitude for all you have given me. God, help us. Amen. Well, speaking of gratitude, we are moving into the section of our service together that is formally about doing that, right? That's formally about offering. And our new missions ministry director, Jerry jo Johnson, is going to come and talk to us for a second. So we want to welcome him. We're so glad that you're on board with us. You're doing an awesome job right out of the gate. What a treat it is. Yeah. Yep, you got it. Is it on? Yeah. Is it on? Yeah. <laughs> right, found that easily there, right? Well, good morning. Um, I do want you to know I'm really excited about the role. Uh, I also realize that uh, there's no way to fill the shoes of uh, Steve LaForge and his wife, Deb. Uh, it would take a village to do that. The good thing is we've got a wonderful village here at, at Woodmont. So I'll be leaning on that. Uh, I, I don't know if you know, we've got over 35 ministries and outreach programs here, here at Woodmont. I invite you to uh, go to the, the website where we now have a virtual ministry fair that will give you a lot of information about uh, those. And then I'd also invite you to join us Wednesday night at dinner and our discipleship class where we'll be talking about our missions here at Woodmont uh, in more detail. My role is to work with all the leaders of these ministries and supporting them, and then to be your go-to as it relates to, to finding uh, a ministry that fits, best fits you and or your family's goals and interests as it re relates to some of these classes and programs, okay? Just, I'll share with you just real briefly on a personal note. I joined Woodmont about 11 years ago, and I would come on Sundays and I would recite uh, along with you uh, our mission statement, growing disciples of Christ by seeking God, sharing love, and serving others. Uh, I would enjoy uh, the message. Uh, I would enjoy the day, but then I'd go home, and I didn't think much about it until the next Sunday, right? It wasn't until I, I accepted invites to, to get involved in some of these ministries and some of these smaller <coughs> classes and programs that I truly began to enjoy and appreciate Woodmont, its wonderful people and all of its wonderful works. So getting involved has been so rewarding in so many ways. It's been so good for my faith. So in closing, I'd like to share uh, from the Gospel of Matthew. Um, it, it's uh, chapter 25, verse 40. And it's Jesus' words, truly I say to you, whatever you did, for the least of mine, I did for you, or you did for me. So I invite you to join me and many others here at Woodmont in living that mission statement, seeking God, sharing your love, and serving others. Thank you, and I look forward to hearing from you. Yeah. Well, 
All right, so we'll sing one last song together. I invite you to stand and sing to each other. We're going to have a prayer for strength as we go out today. Be strong and of a good courage. Be not, be not dismayed. Be strong and of a Be not afraid. Lift your eyes beyond the Jordan and remember who I am. Little children, there it is, the promised land. All right, one last time. Be strong and of a good courage. Be not, be not dismayed. Go forth from this place with love to share and to remember you are loved. Fresh start. Go in peace. Amen.